Good morning, and welcome to AEI and today's event. Is it time to rethink the Federal Reserve? It has not been a good year for the Federal Reserve. It's no secret that the Fed has had problems forecasting inflation and economic growth. Now it's trying to tame the highest inflation rate seen in over 40 years. Over the decades since the Fed adopted its new operating policy of paying interest on reserves, quantitative easing, and inflation rate targeting, the Fed has consistently failed to meet its inflation and full employment targets. Given the Fed's current record, it would not be surprising if some saw a need to revisit the Fed's congressionally mandated responsibilities or the way it conducts monetary policy operations. But instead of probing the causes and possible remedies for the Fed's recent disappointing record on price stability and maximum employment, the current administration and Democrats in Congress have been busy crafting executive orders, passing bills, and proposing new legislation that will fundamentally remake the Fed by requiring it to advance the progressive left's climate change and stakeholder capitalism agenda. These new mandates would require the Fed to actively allocate bank credit in an attempt to prevent global warming, engineer equal outcomes for politically favored racial and ethnic groups, and issue a new tokenized currency that will drain deposits from the banking system, raising the cost and limiting access to bank credit. Why should the Federal Reserve have any authority to direct credit to specifically politically favored activities? The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 required the Fed to provide an elastic currency, not decide which companies can get bank loans and which cannot. Under these new mandates, the Fed would require banks to make politically favored loans similar to, to the way banking is done in China. History shows that when governments direct bank credit, economic growth suffers because credits flow to politically favored inefficient companies instead of funding the productive firms that compete to drive economic growth. Moving from a system where credit is allocated by private markets to a system where credit is dispensed by government decree will reduce opportunities and lower the standard living for all racial and ethnic groups. Why hasn't Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke publicly condemned these developments for what they are? A direct attack on capitalism, free market-driven investment, and Federal Reserve independence. The Fed's new mandate to battle climate change stems from an October 2021 20, report from the Financial Stability Oversight Council. The report concludes that climate change poses a systemic risk to the financial system. To counteract this newly identified risk, the FSOC directs its members, which include the Federal Reserve, to, and I quote, incorporate climate-related financial risk into their regulatory and supervisory activities the FSOC's primary tool for accomplish, accomplishing this is scenario analysis conducted by regulators to measure risk across a broad set of institutions. Scenario analysis, otherwise known as stress testing, has been a key regulatory tool since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act. For the largest banks, stress tests are the mechanism used to set a bank's minimum regulatory capital requirement. Stress tests are hypothetical exercises in which banks estimate their potential losses should the economy suffer a Fed-specified calamitous event. The Fed specifies the economic scenario and, and makes its own estimates as a check on the bank's calculations. It's impossible to know whether stress test loss estimates are accurate. Neither the banks nor the Fed could compare stress test loss estimates with actual outcomes because the hypothetical stress scenarios never happen. Still, banks must hold capital sufficient to cover these scenario-generated hypothetical losses, however large and improbable. But Fed stress tests have a real impact on the allocation of bank capital. Consider Jamie Dimon's recent discussion of Fed stress tests and J.P. Morgan's Chase latest earnings call. Mr. Dimon called the Fed's stress test ridiculous and went on to say that JPM Chase and other banks will be forced to reduce their residential mortgage holdings because of the, Fed, of the Fed's poorly conceived bank stress test. Jamie Dimon said, we don't agree with the stress test. It's inconsistent, it's not transparent, it's too volatile, it's basically capricious and arbitrary. Banks, climate, banks exposures to climate change will be based on stress test, test scenarios that include a so-called transitional risk event in which some unknown future climate change scare causes the Congress to pass new laws that negatively impact greenhouse gas-intensive firms, 
or cause consumers to abandon activities that use fossil fuels. In these scenarios, the impact of imaginary events inflicts severe distress on greenhouse gas intensive firms, potentially forcing them into bankruptcy. These purely conjectural default risk, this purely conjectural default risk will trigger higher capital requirements and other regulatory restrictions for the financial institutions with exposures to these companies. As a consequence, greenhouse gas intensive companies will face higher interest rates and reduce access to bank credit. The Fed has wide regulatory discretion in how it designs and runs stress tests. Should the, vet, the Fed begin to run climate change stress tests, I'm confident the characteristics of these exercises will change as administrations change and as priorities change. Discretion creates regulatory uncertainties that complicate investment planning that ult and ultimately stunt economic growth. The broader the discretion, the greater the regulatory uncertainty. Stress tests are not the only tool the Fed uses to allocate capital. The Fed's quantitative easing operations purchased mortgage-backed securities to lower the cost of residential mortgages to support the housing market. In 2021, 30-year mortgages fell to the lowest levels recorded in modern times. The Fed, these Fed MBS purchases helped to catalyze the rapid home price appreciation that has made housing unaffordable in many markets. If the Democrats in Congress have their way, the Fed's role in allocating capital will not end with a duty to implement progressive climate change agenda. On June 21st of this year, the House passed H.R. 2543, the so-called Financial Services Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Economic Justice Act. This law requires the Fed to adopt state stakeholder capitalism as an operating mandate. Under the act, the Fed must carry out its duties in a manner that supports the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities in employment, income, wealth, and access to affordable credit. Under H.R. 2543, the Fed would no longer be required to follow policies that promote equal opportunity for all, but instead would impose policies designed to engineer equal outcomes for all politically favored racial and ethnic groups. This is a mandate to promote socialism pure and simple. Socialism is an anathema for individual opportunity and economic growth. Any such mandate would be a direct front, affront to the Fed's independence to conduct monetary policy in a manner that promotes price stability and maximum employment. The proliferation of Fed mandates does not end with a mission to produce equity. Democrats in Congress are promising new legislation that require the Fed to issue a central bank digital currency. Congressman Himes of Connecticut recently released a white paper outlining the characteristics of the retail digital currency the Fed will be required to issue in legislation he plans on introducing. The current push for the Fed to issue a central bank digital currency follows a 2020 law that was proposed by Senator Sherrod Brown called the Banking for All Act. That law would have required Federal Reserve banks to make public digital currency accounts freely available to all. Let me, let me uh, underscore freely available to all. Federal Reserve district banks and member banks would have been forced to offer digital wallets called Fed accounts to the public to hold Fed digital dollars. These accounts would be free of charge, pay interest, and provide all the services typically associated with a full service commercial bank checking account, a debit card, ATM access, and electronic bill paying services with no minimum or maximum balance requirements. The bill would have required large banks to absorb the cost of offering Fed accounts while smaller banks, banks smaller than 10 billion in assets, would have had their operating costs reimbursed by the Fed. It is pure fantasy to believe that a Fed digital currency transacting on a blockchain's payment system can somehow make transacting free and freely available to those currently unbanked or those currently banked. All payment systems charge fees to process transactions and cover costs. Distributed ledger payment systems, at least the ones we, see, we have in place today, are among the most resource intensive, that means expensive, systems used to clear and settle money transactions. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain is estimated to use more electricity than the entire country of Argentina to, to process a small number of digital transactions compared to the volume of digital transactions routinely processed by legacy bank-centric payment systems. Bitcoin miners earn enough to cover their electricity costs and earn an attractive return on their 
substantial investment in mining rigs. They are not clearing the set and settling Bitcoin transactions for altruistic reasons or for free. They're motivated by profit. If there are econ economic benefits to be gained by transacting using, a, using tokenized dollars over a digital, over, over a distributed ledger style payment system, they could be realized without a Federal Reserve digital currency. As I've explained elsewhere, Federal Reserve, federally insured institutions could create tokenized deposit accounts insured up to $250,000, the FDIC insurance limit. These tokenized deposits and licensed private stablecoins could provide exactly the same services to meet the criteria and benefits envisioned by Congressman Hines without requiring the Fed to issue a new digital currency, and importantly, without disintermediating the private banking system. However, running a new payment system that clears and settles new tokenized deposits and licensed private stablecoins would incur costs and must, that must be paid by someone. Even if a newer, more energy-efficient blockchain-style payment system is developed, someone will have to bear the cost of processing transactions and maintaining the system. There is no free lunch. Setting aside issues associated with Fed mandates to tackle climate change, equity, and a new, and a new retail central bank digital currency, there is merit in undertaking a serious retrospective analysis of the Fed's performance regarding the Fed's most important tasks, maintaining price stability and maximum employment. When it comes to monetary policy, the Fed's current mandate places equal emphasis on price stability, maximum employment, and arguably the overall stability of the financial sector. Current laws also allow the Fed wide discretion in interpreting, interpreting some of its mandates. Should the Fed assign equal priority to all three goals, or should price stability receive greater weight? The issue of Fed, Fred dis Fed discretion regarding the discharge of its duties has many dimensions. So should wide-ranging QE operations be allowed, or should Fed open market purchases and sales be restricted to government securities? Is flexible inflation targeting the best strategy for, for achieving the Fed's dual mandate, or was it in compl complicit in causing the current inflation? Beyond monetary policy duties, there are many other responsibilities the Fed has been assigned by Congress. They they, they have extensive regulatory powers over state chartered member banks, they regulate bank holding companies, and they have regulatory authority over the payment system. Has the Fed been given too many responsibilities and too much discretion and power to decide how to discharge its duties? Does Congress have the capacity to provide the needed oversight, especially in areas where the Fed has been granted wide discretion in the tools and methods it uses to meet its mandates? If it is time to reimagine the Federal Reserve System, what changes should be made, and how will these changes benefit consumers and the economy? The Federal Reserve is an incredibly important institution. Can its independence be safeguarded from political influences, and if so, how? Do the Fed's current mandates and responsibilities need to be modified to better enable it to achieve stable prices and maximum economic growth? Then there are issues of the system structure, with 12 reserve banks and their independence when it comes to choosing their management. With these questions in mind, or these issues in mind, let me, return, let me turn to our panel of experts for their views and recommendations. Today, I'm happy to welcome three experts on banking, the Federal Reserve mandate, the role of congressional legislation and oversight, and monetary policy. We are happy to welcome, in the order in which they will be speaking, Jerry Dwyer, George Selgin, and Alex Pollack. Gerald Dwyer is a professor and BBT, bb and scholar at Clemson University. He's also a senior fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research and has been affiliated with the Cato Institute and the Center for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis at Australian National University. He served as director of the Center for Financial Innovation and Stability and vice president at the Federal Reserve of the Bank of Atlanta from 1997 to 2012 and he was a, before that, he was a professor at the Clemson University from 1989 to 1999. He is widely published in leading economics and finance journals and serves as co-editor of Finance Research Letters and is on the editorial board of the Journal of Financial Stability. Speaking second, George Selgin. George is a senior fellow and director emeritus of, of, the, uni, of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute. He is also pr Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Georgia. Georgia's widely published research covers a broad range of topics, 
with the field of monetary, in the field of monetary economics, monetary history, macroeconomic theory, and the history of monetary thought. Speaking third is Alex Pollack. Alex is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. His prior position, in prior positions, he served as the principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research in the U.S. Treasury Department, as a distinguished senior fellow at our institute, our Street Institute, and as a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, my colleague here. From 1991 to 2004, he was president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. Alex began his banking career working for Continental Illinois Bank and Trust Company, the bank responsible for introducing too big to fail in the lexicon, in the regulatory lexicon. He is author of Finance and Philosophy, Why We're Always Surprised, Boom and Bust, Financial Cycles and Human Prosperity, as well as numerous articles and congressional testimony. His newest book, Surprised Again, co-authored with Howard Adler, is scheduled to be released this fall. Jerry, the floor is yours. Whoops. I dropped it again. Just carry it around. <clears throat> Comes disattached. <clears throat> it's pretty hard to follow that talk, actually. Um, I'm actually going to go the other direction in the sense of where Congress wants to go and everything else. What I'm going to talk about is, is, is actually divesting activities from the Fed and why that would actually be a good idea. Um, the Fed currently confronts a very difficult situation in terms of inflation, in terms of do we have a recession or not, and how are they going to deal with that? Um, Part of the reason that they have this problem is because of conceptual issues, that is, economic theory issues. And there's nothing I can propose that'll do anything about that, other than if they had right-thinking people, whatever they would be. What I'm going to propose is three changes in the current institutional arrangement that I think would make situations like the current one less likely. I think they would confront some of the issues that Paul raises in terms of um, continual spreading of the mandate of the Fed and what it's supposed to deal with until it basically gobbles up the whole federal government. Um, and these changes are the following. One is pretty simple, and it's been around a long time. And that is that Congress should impose an inflation target, not the members of the FOMC because it's a policy question that is, should be informed by people in the citizens of the country, not by a set of experts who decide whether it should be two or four, for example, which is the issue that's coming up. So this might take the form of the Federal Reserve shall take policy actions that are expected to make the inflation rate measured by whatever equal to n percent, whatever percent on an annual basis. And you could add, consistent with the maximum employment, is in pursuing this mandate, the Federal Reserve will attempt to facilitate full employment, or if you insist, maximum employment, which doesn't have any clear meaning. And that's basically the idea. It could be a target for nominal GDP, um, and that would actually be an improvement, I think, but it's not really necessary one way or another. The second thing I'm going to propose is, is taking interest on reserves and either setting them to zero or a fraction of the interest rate on, say, one-month treasury bills, say half. And so there's no discretion in terms of the Fed setting it. It's just determined by the one-month treasury bill rate. The third thing I'm going to suggest is the most radical of them all, which is that the Federal Reserve's financial stability and bank regulatory duties should just be shifted to the comptroller of the currency. The part, of, part of the issue that the Fed confronts, and it it's, came up in various ways in Paul's talk, is, is that they're involved in affecting relative prices, they're involved in affecting activities. They're not just determining the inflation rate, which from a certain point of view is something that there are very few people who say, oh, a 10% inflation rate, oh, that's really good. 
you know, most people prefer lower inflation, whether it's two or four. Um, and so this financial stability, the bank regulation stuff actually started back with state member banks in 1913, but it definitely expanded with Dodd-Frank. Um, okay, so the inflation target, I want to say on the front end, it could be nominal GNP instead, and I think that's fine either way. Um, there's a standard economic argument for having an inflation target and guides the public's expectations, and that's part of the reason the Fed introduced an inflation target. It actually makes it easier to hit the target if people know what it is you're trying to do, as opposed to keeping it a secret, which was more the strategy in the 50s. Now, the thing is, is the target has to be credible. It has to be believable. And this basically relies on the central bank's re reputation, if the Fed's going to set the target especially. Before the recent pandemic, the Federal Reserve had a pretty solid reputation of not generating high inflation. Um, it wasn't hitting the target of 2%, but it was, it was like one and three quarters. And one and three quarters, uh, that's pretty close to two, realistically, I think. So then Chairman Powell in Jackson Hall in 2020 announced a new consensus at the FMC. One, less important for what I'm talking about, shortfalls of employment from its maximum level rather than deviations. And so if the economy is, you know, in the business economist parliaments running too hot, then we'll just ignore it. We don't care. That's okay. And then the other part that really is central to what I'm talking about is a flexible form of average inflation targeting. This was very imprecisely stated, okay? in the following two ways, actually. One of them is, well, how far of a deviation from the average is okay? Four, let's suppose the target's two. Four, is that okay? Three, six, 22. What's, what's beyond the bounds of what you reasonably want? And the other part of it is an average, an average over time. Well, over how long? Over a year? Clearly not that. Two or three years? Five years? How long? That is, what, what got lost with this average inflation targeting is any real sense of what it was the Federal Reserve wanted to do, except for one thing, actually, I think. That one thing was is they wanted to increase the inflation rate. They wanted it to be higher. That's why, that's why the shortfalls, that's why the average, because the average was below. So, okay, we want the average to be two, so obviously we want it to be more than two. All right, so they got their wish, that's for sure. So I mentioned reputation. Reputations can come from two different ways. There's a lot of theoretical literature on all this stuff, but you don't have to get terribly theoretical to understand what's going on. It can come from observing somebody's behavior over time. You know, for example, if you're dealing with a person and when they say something, it's what they believe to be correct, then over time you trust them to at least say what they believe to be correct. It can also come in some context, not in that one, from a constraint being imposed that requires that you do something. You can interpret a statement of 2% inflation by the Fed as a self-imposed constraint. It's really like saying you won't eat french fries because you want to lose weight. All right? So they said, okay, we, we want 2% inflation. It's not a constraint imposed by somebody else. If they violate it, nothing happens. At least, I mean, the public might get upset, but nobody else. It's a self-composed constraint, and it arises elsewhere. For example, in retirement plans, it arises. An alternative is an externally imposed constraint. Yeah, as you could have, okay, I'm gonna save 10% a year for, for retirement, and that's just the way it's gonna work. Now, the other way is, is if your employer's concerned, you actually might not save anything, and then you're gonna to wanna to work until you're 93, because you don't have any retirement saving, is, they require that you save some. And so one of your, when one of your kids needs shoes, well, you'll just, you won't save a little less 
You'll just have to work around it somehow. So having the federal government pass a law that sets a goal for the goals for the Fed is an external constraint. And the advantage of that is the Fed can't say, well, we like average inflation targeting. Or, I mean, people are arguing for this right now. Well, we prefer four. We think that's a nice, Janet Yellen argued for this for quite a while while she was, after she was chair of the FOMC and before she was secretary of the treasury. And she's not the only one. Um, and so they could change it to four any day. So that's not much of a constraint in a lot of ways. Um, and so a law that's set by the administration, it would have to be explicit. It could be explicit one of two ways, actually. See, one way is, is like in some countries, is it says the administration will, at some date each year or every two years, will tell the central bank what its inflation target is. And so, for example, when this happens, this is when one party comes in at, say, 2%, and another party comes in and it's 4%. And then it goes back to 2%. I mean, so it vacillates, that's true. But on the other hand, it's also true that it reflects the will of the public of the country filtered through the political process. You know, and you may say, well, it'd be better if it weren't filtered through the political process, but we don't know any way of doing things. Um, you know, people often say that, that a republic's the worst kind of government you can get except for everything else. And so, personally, I think it's better if it's consistent with the views of the public as opposed to determined by a set of experts in, without a lot of public input. Okay, so how about interest on reserves? Interest on reserves is definitely a recent innovation with the financial crisis. It was coming anyway. And so the Fed currently pays interest on reserves that's actually more than the one-month Treasury bill rate. All right, so that means if you're running a bank and you have a choice of holding short-term Treasury bills or reserves, well, reserves are better. One, they pay more interest. Two, they're actually cheaper to translate into something else. That is, you don't have to sell them. All you have to do is transfer them to someone else. Um, and they're available instantaneously. I mean, it seems to me like they're a superior asset to one of the treasury bills for a bank anyway. And so that's created the situation in which the Federal Reserve can acquire trillions of dollars of assets because it's basically operating those hedge funds. That is, it's borrowing short and lending long, which is resulting in the usual, when long-term interest rates go up, you get losses. But even leaving that aside, it means that, as Paul was talking about, well, we want to, subs we want to encourage housing. Okay, so they bought mortgage-backed securities. Actually, I'm not sure they want to encourage it, but they certainly financed very large government deficits. There were periods in which the Fed was buying all the new debt that was issued by the Treasury. Uh, that sounds like a banana republic. Um, it's not a good thing. Um, now, it is called quantitative easing. That makes it sound more respectable than just financing a government deficit. And as long as, see, my point of view on this is, is as long as interest on reserves is determined the way it is, they're going to continue to operate with trillions of dollars in assets. They have an incentive to do it. And so they'll continue. So how can you get rid of this incentive? Well, one way is that you can just eliminate interest on reserves. Obviously, you'd have to do it over time. You wouldn't do it like tomorrow. There's no interest on reserves. That would be a dramatic transformation in portfolios very quickly. But an alternative to that, which was suggested by George, actually, is you could make it a fraction of the interest rate on Treasury bills. That is, what you could do is, is not leave it up to the Fed's discretion what to set the interest rate on reserves to be. You say it's going to be a half of the interest rate on one with Treasury bills. 
And that's not a policy interest rate. That is an alternative would be to set it equal to half the Fed funds rate. But the trouble with that is, is the Fed sets the fund, Fed funds rate. But just half the one month treasury bill rate. And that compensates banks for holding reserves. You could make it three quarters. The fraction doesn't really matter as long as it's a fraction and it's noticeably below 100%. And then the Fed's ability to finance this very large portfolio would basically go away because that's how they're financing it. The advantage of that, as Paul was discussing, so I don't really need to go into it at all, is they become credit allocators, and it's only going to get worse. Think of the automobile companies get in trouble. Okay, well, why don't you buy some automobile debt while you're at it? Or other things. Or what you're getting right now, of course, is, well, we hate these fracking companies, so don't lend them any money. Um, so more and more credit allocation is going to come in as long as this continues, I think. And returning to a viable Fed funds market would actually have, a, have an internal effect on the way the Federal Reserve operates. Um, the interest rate on Fed, on Fed funds is determined by the Federal Open Market Committee. The interest rate on Fed funds today doesn't matter for anything. It matters to federal home loan banks and a few other organizations that can't collect interest on reserves directly from the Fed. So they lend it to banks and then the banks collect the interest on their reserves. That's all it's doing. It's the interest rate on reserves that really matters. And if you make it equal to three quarters, then you're gonna go back to the system where the federal funds rate actually mattered a lot. And determine, yeah, and it was basically the policy instrument. Where that matters in terms of the organization of the Fed is, is that it's, it's the board that sets the interest rate on reserves. And so literally speaking, today, the only monetary authority that really matters is the board. They set the interest rate on reserves, that's the interest rate that matters, the interest rate on Fed funds, who cares? That's set by the FOMC, but, and the presidents are involved, but who cares? And so the presidents get cut out of monetary policy. Um, and so this would bring them back into being involved in monetary policy in a more direct way. All right, the last thing, this is like the most radical thing I'm suggesting, I think, actually, is the Fed's become the premier bank regulator. They even say that like in the newspaper. Um, they're supposed to be a central bank, not the FDIC. And the problem is, what you get into, as Paul mentioned again, is, oh, well, this regulation, we can affect climate, their lending for things that are associated with climate change. Um, you actually have gotten Federal Reserve Banks, um, one of them I call the Climate Change Federal Reserve Bank, Another one I call the Social Justice Federal, Federal Reserve Bank. They've gotten into all kinds of ancillary activities that have nothing to do with keeping inflation low. Or in other words, you could say they're taking their eye off the ball and they're getting concerned about a lot of other things. And financial stability is an ongoing concern. And it's really a distraction from being concerned about low and stable inflation. So at the start of the pandemic, I don't know if you noticed, at the start of the pandemic, what did the Fed do when, when the lockdown? What it did was is it reintroduced all the old programs from 2007 and 2008. It's like the problem was totally different. The economy was being shut down. It wasn't the case that people were concerned about the balance sheets of banks and whether they were solvent or insolvent or whether the assets they were holding, what they were really worth. And so they ended up purchasing large amounts of government debt that partly financed transfer payments to households. I call this a helicopter drop of money. It's why we have inflation now. Is so the Fed came in and basically financed all these transfer payments that showed up in people's bank accounts and they spent them over time, or spending them over time. That's what would be predicted by theory. It's hardly unusual. 
So I would suggest it would be better if the Federal Reserve were just a central bank and not the premier bank regulator. See, it started off as a bank regulator for state bank, state member banks. State banks that weren't members of the Federal Reserve, they were regulated after 1933 by the FDIC and by the state they were chartered in. The Comptroller of the Currency regulates national banks. All the large banks are national banks, and so the Comptroller is probably the most sensible place to place bank regulation for financial stability and other things. I mean, another alternative, I'm not necessarily in favor of this, would just be to create a new government agency that's the Financial Stability Agency. Now, part of this, too, is related to bank regulation, is the more the Fed gets involved in changing relative prices that people face in the economy and generating rents for some people and making other people worse off, is the more politicians are going to want to get involved in this allocation issue because it's what they do. Um, and so Fed independence, I think, is important. And we sort of saw an extreme example this week in the Wall Street Journal where Elizabeth Warren, yeah, Elizabeth Warren wrote a, an op-ed basically telling the Fed how it should lower inflation because they don't know how to do it, and she does because she's a lawyer. Um, as the Fed becomes involved in more regulatory issues, the problem is just going to get worse, and the independence is going to disappear. Now, there is a counter-argument. Actually, one of the things is, you might not remember this, but before, before the financial crisis, the bank regulator and the central bank in England were separate. And after the financial crisis, they put them together because of problems that they perceived they had. What I'm suggesting is, I'm not saying that it isn't better if you have one regulator during a financial crisis, but financial crises don't happen every year. Inflation does happen every year. And the central bank's regular activities happen every year. And I think it's possible to overcome. The argument, because I was at the Fed at the time, the argument is, is that, well, if it's internal, then you have a better idea of what's going on rather than if you have to talk to these external agencies. I think it's easy to overdraw that. So that lack of knowledge doesn't really seem surmountable, insurmountable. So to summarize, basically what I'm suggesting is three things. They're not necessarily the only three things in the world that you could change about the Fed, but it seems to me like they might make it less likely that we end up in situations like today. One of them is, is have a goal set by the political authorities, whether it's the value, or just a procedure so that the administration tells the Federal Reserve periodically. Either way, uh, I'm, I'm not really wedded to any of, anything in particular that way at all. It's partly to let the citizens of the country have something to say about what the inflation target's going to be and make it difficult for the Federal Reserve, when they're tempted to do something different, to do something different because they don't have the ability to do it on their own. Make the interest rate on reserves lower relative to market rates. And that'll basically eliminate the, it won't eliminate the, entirely the, the size of the current portfolio for regulatory reasons, but it'll definitely make it lower. And then move bank regulation, especially financial stability out of the Federal Reserve. Um, this, this whole scenario analysis is just going to be an, even an increasingly difficult problem, especially now that people have figured out it's a way to backdoor regulation that they can't get any other way. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, George? Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Appreciate this opportunity. Paul, uh, thanks for having me. When Paul called me or wrote to me I th uh, about uh, this event, he said, well, we want to do something about uh, whether there's any way to improve upon the Fed. Of course, I, I racked my brains. I said, improve on the Fed, improve on the Fed. A couple of days, just absolute torment because... How could you possibly improve? Anyway, then, then, uh, then I got another message saying who the other panelists would be. And 
Of course, I realized that I was just being asked to be the, the token moderate. <clears throat> and <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, okay, I'm going to talk about some very minor things, you know, just a little bit of deck chair rearranging, as it were. So I want to focus on the question of the monetary policy framework, the, the, the targeting framework specifically. I do want to say a little bit about one thing that Jerry, when, of course Jerry talked about that a little bit as well. I'm going to just go into a little more uh, detail on my thoughts. But uh, I do want to say something about what, uh, another part of what Jerry was talking about, which is the whole question of interest on reserves and setting the interest rate on reserves below the Treasury bill rate, which as, as Jerry said, is something I favor. But what a lot of people don't know, I wrote a Wall Street Journal piece about this some years ago, is that, in fact, the present law says, I should step back a bit, the law on which interest payments on reserves is based was originally a 2006 measure, that is, something passed before the great financial crisis. And uh, the specifics of the law, and, and particularly the specifics regarding how interest payments on reserves were to be uh, set uh, didn't change when in 2008 they had another law that accelerated the implementation of the 2006 law so they could put interest on reserves right away. Anyway, those details say that the interest rate on reserves should not exceed the going rate, I'm paraphrasing, on market rate on short-term low-risk security. Well, that would do what Jerry's saying, because that would mean it would have to be a fraction below one of the uh, uh, rate on Treasury bills. Except the Fed, under our wonderful legal arrangements, gets to decide exactly what the law means. So their lawyers went at it and they came up with a list of interest rates that could be viewed as representing the market short-term low-risk interest rates. And they put a bunch of things there that were reasonable enough, like treasury securities, treasury short-run treasury bills. But one of the things they added to the list was the Federal Reserve's prime rate. That's the, that's the discount rate at which the Fed makes emergency loans to banks. By statute, the Fed sets that rate. It's not a market rate, first of all. Second, it always sets it way above. <laughs> Back then, it was 75 basis points above its own policy target rate, which means it's always way above the interest rate, uh, uh, the short term, uh, uh, the federal funds rate or the anything like it, and that means it's going to be above the bill rate. So that's how they get away with paying interest on reserves at a rate that is sometimes substantially higher than the one-month Treasury bill rate and is almost always a little higher than that rate because they put an interest rate in their interpretation of the, the rule that is always way above the one-month uh, treasury bill rate or always way above the federal funds rate by procedure, really, right? And uh, that's how they did it. So, of course, the problem is you have a law that already says the Fed should do what Jerry says it should do, but the Fed's lawyers have managed their way around it. I think that's kind of annoying, personally. But uh, I thought, So the question is, how do we get them to do what they should do already by law? Don't ask me. Anyway, I'm going to talk mainly about, uh, about uh, the monetary policy framework and uh, specifically inflation. And I want to start by asking and answering the question of how we got into the present mess, right, where we have essentially double-digit inflation, quite close anyway, uh, depending on which of the, the most recent statistics have suggested that there were, were there. And uh, I think there are three reasons, some of which Jerry alluded to, that got us into this situation. One that hasn't been mentioned, but I think is very important, 
is that when the great financial crisis, uh, sorry, when the COVID-19 crisis broke out shortly afterwards, the Fed was implementing all these programs. It immediately, immediately lowered the interest rate on reserves back down towards zero, not quite zero. One of the things Fed officials started saying then, several of them, was, well, we don't expect to be raising interest rates again until 2023 or even 2024. This, these prognostications were repeated regularly in the press. Now, uh, this is an example of what's known as forward guidance, right? You're letting people know. You're not just telling them what your current policy is. The Fed is telling them how it's going to manage interest rates into the future. Now, it's true that these weren't official statements in the sense that they were hard and fast. They said, well, we don't, ex they were expressions of what the Fed officials expected. But that, in practice, is the same as if the Fed officials had said, we are not going to raise interest rates for that long. Now, forward guidance in general is not a bad thing. It can be very helpful for implementing monetary policy. But in order for it to be helpful and not harmful, it should be expressed in terms that the Fed need not regret expressing because it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't commit itself to something that make a commitment it might not, that it might not want to keep. So it might have said, we could keep these interest rates, we may keep them down for a long time. In fact, we're going to keep them low as long as we need to. That's okay. But when Fed officials say 2023 or 2024, then, of course, if it's getting close to 2023 and interest rates and there are there's any reason why they might want to raise interest rates before 2023, now they have a difficult choice to make. Do you undermine your credibility by breaking what the public has taken to be a commitment to not raise interest rates? Or do you undermine your credibility by not keeping inflation under control, which you've also said you would do? In May of last year, I was on Macro Musings, which is a podcast uh, actually done by a former student of mine, David Beckworth, which you should all listen to, especially when I'm on it. And, uh, and uh, we talked about this, and I said, David, I'm telling you, the, when the inflation had only just started, it was starting to get troublesome. It wasn't really bad. I said, I said, David, I'm telling you, when the time comes and they need to raise rates, they're not going to do it. They're going to hesitate. They're going to wait. And uh, that delay is going to prove uh, costly. And that's exactly what happened, if I may say so myself. And, uh, and uh, so this was a big problem. And I really do think that, that the signal, the commitment they gave, or rather the, the, the statements that they made a year or more before, put them in a trap. So this was one of the things that happened. Of course, they did finally get around this raising rates as the inflation rate got, got much worse. But the delay was absolutely uh, a, 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 a very, very harmful thing. Because the longer they delayed, then the more dramatically they would have to raise rates to get inflation under control. And the greater the, the risk they faced of allowing expectations of inflation to start taking off. So factor number one. Bad forward guidance, undesirable forward guidance. Second thing, which Jerry has talked about, was the switch to what, uh, uh, what's known as flexible average inflation targeting. The very fact that you need an acronym with four terms should warn you that this could be something extremely dangerous. And in fact, uh, what it was was something motivated Remember, this switch is happening before COVID. It's motivated by the fact that for some time the Fed was struggling to get inflation as high as 2%. It was persistently below since the great financial crisis, with rare exception. And so they decided that they had to make up for these past undershoots of inflation. So flexible average inflation targeting was, first of all, a way to justify allowing inflation to go above 2% if they could get it there, 
with the idea of returning eventually the, the price level to the path it would have been on had there not been any undershooting in the past. Now, there are a million problems with flexible average inflation targeting, particularly the way the Fed did it, and they all have to do with the F. It's an effed up version of inflation targeting. And the, the, the problem is that they never specified what flexible means. There are a million different ways to do this. And uh, examples, and Jerry alluded to some of these, how far back do you look when you want to decide what trend path it is you're getting back to? Depending on where you start, the path is going to be different, and therefore the amount of inflation that you might tolerate or the degree of change in the price level that you're going to tolerate before you say, okay, we're back, and now we're going to do 2% from now on, that's going to depend on how far back you look. The, the size of the window is the technical term. They never said. They never said. The other one was, how fast do we get back? Do we get back in a month, two months, a year? Even now, if you pick these parameter values correctly, even now, at least this was true a month ago when I checked, you could make a case that we're still just catching up to the target price path. We're so there's nothing wrong. Policies, we're, we're doing exactly what we want to do. There's no problem, everybody. Nothing to see here. Of course, uh, I don't think it's clear now that Fed officials aren't reasoning that way. But the problem is that the public had no idea when, whether it was true, and still has no, no definite, concrete way of knowing, whether the inflation rate is above 2%, because it's part of the strategy, but it's, everything's fine, the Fed is in control, or whether it has lost control, or at least is not sticking to its promises, because the promise, the commitment, the rule, is too vague. And eventually, of course, you get to a point where the public says, maybe they can't do it, maybe they've lost control, maybe this isn't working. And that's when those expectations of higher inflation can start to take off, make the Fed's challenge even worse. So those are the two things so far that got us into this mess. The third is supply shocks. I think now everybody knows that part of the problem behind the current inflation is that it isn't just a question of the Fed's having allowed spending to grow too quickly after the COVID-19 crisis, or rather, after we started recovering from that crisis. As has been mentioned, and as is absolutely true, the, the Fed's operations caused a big increase during the crisis, not just of bank reserves, because we know under the current system, bank reserves can grow like mad. It doesn't necessarily mean people spend more. But in fact, the broader measures of the money supply, and narrower ones like M2, they started to expand uh, a great, they expanded a great deal. And velocity, which itself had been uh, falling during the crisis, collapsing, started to recover again. So if velocity is collapsing and the money supply grows only enough to offset it, which was true at first, that's not people aren't spending a whole lot. But if you keep all that money out there or keep adding to it, and then people start to spend again, now you've got a problem. But as I started to say, the situation has been complicated since uh, partly by COVID and supply bottlenecks, as they called it, can call them connected with COVID, but also since then by the war in Russia and Ukraine. And that means that besides the recovery of spending, we've had real reductions in the availability of certain crucial goods, services, commodities, particularly oil. And those have contributed to that much more inflation. They've raised the inflation rate beyond what the revival of spending alone would have done. Now, personally, I believe, and I'll go into this, I think it's desirable for central banks, including the Fed, to see through these adverse supply, uh, this adverse supply-driven sort of inflation. That is, 
if prices are only rising, or to the extent that they're rising because goods have be truly become scarcer, it's better to let them rise. Because the alternative of monetary tightening in that case is to essentially add insult to injury. We, we are suffering from the shortages of goods that make prices rise. What tightening money to prevent that does is to say, okay, well, we're going to make sure your incomes fall, so that way you won't be able to afford those goods at those higher prices. And that actually doesn't make people better off, their money earners. Economists have recognized this for a long time. Now, here's a case where the, the F in flexible inflation Average inflation targeting would, is a, could be a good thing, right? We want to be flexible in the sense that we want to see through supply, adverse supply shocks, whether they are making goods more scarce or exceptionally abundant. Either way, we'll let our inflation rate vary with that uh, for those exceptional cases around the long run target. But the Federal Reserve never clearly explained to the public that this was something it would do, that this was part of the rationale for the flexibility that they were seeking. And so, once again, the public was left into the dark, is the fact that prices are rising partly due to supply factors. Does that mean the Fed is aware of that and is just letting it happen on purpose because it doesn't want to uh, limit inflation in these cases? Or is the Fed failing to meet its commitment? If you're going to make an exception for adverse supply shocks, you need to do two things. You need to say so, and make it clear to the public. You need to let them know exactly the extent to which you believe inflation, measured inflation, is due to those shocks. You need to provide some proof of it. And then, of course, you need to make sure that the inflation rate is only increasing in, to an extent, consistent with those factors and not more than that. Fed did none of these things. Now, I'd like to suggest, based on these remarks, how we could improve upon the Fed's performance. Uh, and, uh, of course, I think some of the answers should be obvious enough from the explanations I, I've given. First of all, forward guidance. I don't know why Fed officials keep getting this wrong, but the obvious rule here is don't engage in forward guidance of the sort you might regret. <laughs> Just use the policy, use forward guidance when it's safe to do so and in a manner that's safe. Say you'll keep the interest rate here or there or somewhere else as long as necessary to deal with this crisis or that, that's fine, that's safe. That doesn't commit you to keeping it somewhere you don't want it later. But don't say a date. That's not complicated. So that's, that's reform number one, fix number one. Number two, if you're gonna have an inflation target and you want it to be flexible, you have to say how. You have to be specific, because the whole point of, in, of targeting a monetary variable, of any sort of monetary rule, and here we're talking about a rule voluntarily adopted by the Fed, so I don't mean one imposed on it, is that it works best if people see that you're sticking to it. That's the whole idea. The idea is not to scare people by having them be in the dark about whether you're doing what you should be doing, or at least what you think you should be doing. So you've got to specify all the parameters. And then you have to obey the rule with those parameters properly specified. That's not hard either. Of course, you have to think hard about this because uh, as with bad forward guidance, when you come up with a rule with specifics, you want to make sure the specifics aren't ones that you'll regret under any circumstances that are easily envisioned in advance. So. Give yourself uh, uh, parameters that are safe. Finally, and this is a more concrete proposal based on <clears throat> the second, <clears throat> I think the Fed should abandon inflation targeting altogether. That the best option would be nominal 
nominal income or nominal GDP targeting. I'm going to grab a little water and come right back. Is that okay? We'll, we'll pick that up in a Q&A. We've got to get Alex. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll pick up. And then okay. okay. Um, but um, uh, I, uh, with nominal GDP targeting, first of all, don't let those initials scare you. Uh, GDP, you all know real GDP is a measure of the economy's product every year. Nominal GDP is a measure of total spending on that product, so it's the output of goods and services times their prices. Well, obviously nominal GDP <clears throat> can go up either because the price level is going up or because real output's going up. But it's a measure of spending, the flow of spending. Nominal GDP targeting means that the Fed stabilizes total spending or demand for goods and services. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Not, and, and that's all. It, it stabilizes the amount of money flowing against goods and services, which it can do. It can't stabilize real GDP because it's subject to those shocks that we were talking about before. The Fed can't control that. But it can stabilize total spending. And when it does that, it's really stabilizing the monetary side of the price level or the inflation rate. It's preventing changes in the money supply times its velocity from altering the inflation rate. You set a nominal GDP growth rate that's, let's see, if you set it around 5%, you will get average inflation of around 2% unless things, the real output long run growth rate were to change dramatically from in the past. So that's assuming real long run growth of 2 to 3%. 2 to 5 percent, 2 to 2.5 percent. Now, now that's going to give you in the long run an expected inflation rate of about 2 percent. But it's going to be flexible in the sense that the real inflation rate will vary around that average. So it is average inflation targeting. But with this difference, the variations around the average are entirely due to supply shocks by construction. And those are the variations that you want most. Now, Going from inflation targeting to nominal GDP targeting requires a lot of public education. You have to explain it, as I've tried to do a little bit now. Right? You've got to make clear what it means, that, uh, that there's no, no, n n nothing absurd about it and all that. But once they did that, they would have a rule or a targeting strategy. <clears throat> they still have to specify some parameters of the sorts we were talking about before that wouldn't obviate the need for that. But it would be a much more straightforward way to achieve the kind of flexibility that's most desirable around long-run inflation targeting. And therefore, I think that would be a very desirable reform. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you very much. George. And now, Alex, you have the stand. But while Alex is getting ready here, I just want to summarize George's point. So the Fed got it exactly wrong. It has an ambiguous target, but it gave very specific guidance. They should, have had a, they should have had a specific target and an ambiguous guidance. So they just... They, like yeah, yeah, okay. Alex? Thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you for inviting me, especially with, with these colleagues whose remarks I enjoyed immensely. Uh, and as you suggested, Paul, the Federal Reserve is having a bad year, indeed. In summary, there are three reasons. At first, they utterly failed in their inflation forecasts and performance. Uh, secondly, they have huge mark-to-market -market losses in their own investments, uh, making them technically insolvent at the moment. Uh, and thirdly, as, a, as has been discussed here, but is very important, they may have uh, political pressure to do things that they shouldn't be doing, and in fact, it shouldn't be done at all like central government allocation of credit. Now, starting uh, with the inflation, of course, we all know the Fed's uh, failure to anticipate the high and indeed runaway inflation of 2021 when they were looking forward at the end of 2020 uh, is well known, but they did it all over again the next year. And looking in December 2021 at 2022, they got it uh, completely wrong again uh, with a median inflation forecast for the, their uh, PCE inflation of 2.6%, and now it's running well over 6% halfway through the year. And as we all know, the CPI uh, 
over 9%, or as George said, uh, if on a running basis, and apparently in double digits. Uh, at the end of 2021, the Fed forecast there'd be three, to three one quarter percent increases in the federal funds rate by the end of, by the end of uh, 2022. Uh, tomorrow, they're going to, it appears, raise the Fed funds raise three quarters of a percent to two and a half percent uh, already, uh, which is over the level that they had forecast for the end of 2024. So the Fed can't reliably forecast economic outcomes or the results of their own actions or even what their own actions will be. And knowing that you can't do that is part of wisdom. Uh, if you're a central banker or anyone else, because of course no one else can forecast these things either. So don't expect, here's the wisdom for us as economic actors and observers, do not expect any special economic or financial insight from the Fed. They don't have any special insight uh, compared to the, the rest of the world. Uh, and this isn't at all due to lack of intelligence or education or effort or data or computer power. It's all due to the fundamental uncertainty of the economic and financial future, which is ineluctable and affects us all. So don't, don't have faith in the Fed in that way. Now this recalls a, a great uh, 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 comment by Ben Bernanke when chairman of the Fed and was pushing one stage of, Q, of a QE or quantitative easing when he told um, the Federal Open Market Committee that this will, quote, be a shot in the proverbial dark, unquote. Now that was honest. Unfortunately, he only said it inside the Fed. Uh, we need to understand a lot of what's going on is, is exactly a shot in the proverbial dark. Uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Australia was recently quoted as saying they were embarrassed by their failure at inflation forecasting of late. Uh, and such an admission of mistakes, which are so obvious, that would be becoming in anyone, including the Fed. Uh, now, tomorrow, uh, when the Fed funds rate goes to something like 2.5%, uh, that may sound high. It, it does seem high if you're used to zero, but, but of course, in real terms, it's extremely low. In, in real terms, that's a negative real interest rate of about six and a half percent, very far uh, from being a high, high rate. And for savers who've been used to getting basically zero, maybe zero point. 0.1% on their savings as a national average, they maybe can get 2% now, which will seem high, but is still a rapid loss of purchasing power on their savings, which are being expropriated uh, basically by the central bank. Uh, and so the moves though far, thus far, however, to looking for 2.5% tomorrow, have certainly let substantial air out of the asset price bubble or the everything bubble, as we've so often discussed at AEI, that everything bubble in stocks, especially speculative stocks, bonds, houses, mortgages, and cryptocurrencies. Uh, and all of this has been uh, inflated by the Federal Reserve and its fellow central banks, all doing this together in a coordinated way over the last uh, number of years, but especially uh, starting in 2020. Uh, now, uh, nowhere are the shrinking asset prices of the day more apparent than in the Fed's own balance sheet. Uh, Paul and I have calculated the uh, mark-to-market loss of, uh, of the Federal Reserve on its investments is over $500 billion. We guess about $540 billion. Uh, as of June, uh, on the Fed's massive portfolio of long-term bonds and mortgages. Uh, how, does the, how does the mark-to-market loss of, let's call it, $500 billion compare to the Fed's total capital? Anybody know what the capital of the Fed is? Paul does. Uh, 
Well, it's $41 billion. So it's more than, they've lost, in mark-to-market terms, more than 10 times uh, their total capital. Now, this is an un unrealized loss. They haven't sold it yet. Uh, but it does indicate if the interest rates embedded in those market prices come true, a future operating losses. Now, the Fed is aware of this problem, making their year uh, worse, and they have the defense that this is all unrealized, and in the end, if we just hold these things, and they'll all pay off at par. That's one defense, and the uh, second defense is, well, we already have an accounting solution to this. If we, if we actually realize losses on sales of securities or through operations, we're just going to hide these losses by booking them into an intangible negative liability. You gotta get your mind around this called a deferred asset. And now it's a lot of fun to imagine if you, let's say you took a, the chief examiner of the Federal Reserve and asked him what he would say to a bank holding company that he regulated, if it's mark to market loss was 10 times their capital, uh, or if they proposed taking this loss and instead of putting it into retained earnings and reducing capital. Instead, they proposed putting it into a deferred asset, intangible account. What would this examiner say? One wonders. In fact, one doesn't wonder. Now, the uh, issue on the Fed balance sheet, we can say quickly, in round numbers, the Fed has $8.9 trillion in assets approximately $8 trillion of these are long-term fixed rate assets, long-term government bonds and long-term mortgages, mostly 30-year mortgage securities. They've got about $3 trillion in non-interest bearing liabilities, which means there's a $5 trillion net position of long-term, very long-term fixed rate assets funded by floating rate liabilities, these very interest-bearing reserves, mostly, uh, that Jerry and George uh, talked about. So that's a net position of $5 trillion. Uh, that net position looks exactly like a giant 1980s savings and loan, $5 trillion of long-term fixed-rate assets funded by floating rate liabilities. And you will see, the way I do it, the easy way is for each 1% that the Fed's cost of funds of variable rate liabilities increases. That's a loss per year in, in income of $50 billion. So 1% increase in bonds on a running rate basis, pro forma, $50 billion less income. Uh, as of the first quarter of 2021, the Fed was running at an annualized rate of $130 billion of net profit. So you can see that if interest rates have gone up by two and a quarter percent, which they have on an annualized basis or running basis, that wipes out most of the profit. Uh, now that's the easy way that I do it. The hard and more professional way that Paul does it is to actually model this income statement. And when we do that, we discover that at a, uh, at a short term rate of 2.7 percent, uh, the Fed stops earning any money, and at any rate over 2.7%, it starts losing money on an operating basis, and these rates, uh, we all guess, are going over 2.7%. And this will generate significant uh, operating losses. Now, the Fed's own staff and recent projections in a highly interesting paper called An Analysis of the Interest Rate Risk of the Federal Reserve's Balance Sheet projections under alternate interest rate paths, uh, estimates that the Fed's aggregate operating losses under their base case, which is pretty moderate um, interest rate increases, will lose an aggregate of $60 billion uh, in operating losses. That's cash out the door that never will come back. Uh, that's 150% of their capital. Uh, and that there will be no payments to the Treasury for three years under the base case. So the Fed takes its profit, pays a dividend to its shareholders, which we'll talk about more in a minute, uh, and uh, 
and then the rest it sends to the Treasury. Under the base case, there'll be no payments to the Treasury for three years. That means the deficit goes up by that much more. That's actually a loss being borne by the taxpayers. Uh, well, that's the base case, but rates could go a lot higher than that. Uh, under this uh, Fed staff's 90% uh, confidence rate, which would be higher short-term rates, uh, the, uh, the losses they estimate could aggregate up to $180 billion, and there would be no payments to the Treasury through 2030, uh, which would be a serious matter uh, for, the, uh, for, the tr for the taxpayers because the Treasury wouldn't be getting this money. And, uh, should it be a serious matter? Here's an interesting question. Should it be a serious matter for the shareholders of the Fed? Who are the shareholders of the Fed? Well, all the Federal Reserve Banks are owned by the commercial banks. Well, first of all, the national banks and any member state banks and, and savings associations. And... Uh, well, if ordinarily, if you're a common shareholder of something and that something isn't making any money, uh, you might think that your dividend would be cut. That'd be normal, wouldn't it? Um, and as a matter of fact, in a, at least one highly thought of central bank, namely the Swiss National Bank, they have a requirement in their governing law that if they're out of earnings, they can't pay their dividends their shareholders, and a few years ago, uh, in 2013, they passed their dividend, and there's a very interesting uh, presentation by the chairman of the Swiss National Bank basically saying to all the shareholders, who include the, the cantons or the, or the states, we might say, of Switzerland, sorry, no dividend this year because we're having losses. Well, can we imagine the Fed telling its shareholders, gee, we have to cut your... Uh, you have to cut your dividends. That would be a, an interesting political uh, political situation. Now, it so happens that the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, we find, which is an alma mater of our colleague Jerry, actually did pass its dividend uh, one year uh, in the past. We, we find this from a very interesting history of the bank, written by the bank itself, uh, in which it writes... It may surprise those familiar with the billions of dollars of profit that the Federal Reserve... I, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. That, that the Federal Reserve Bank's return to the U.S. Treasury each year to learn that in its earliest years, and again during the Depression, the Reserve Banks had to struggle to make, men's e to make ends meet. In its first full year of operation, that would be 1950, 1915, the Atlanta Bank fell far short of the money needed to pay the 6% dividend owned, owed to the shareholders. Like many struggling businesses, writes the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta itself, it suspended its dividend that year. So it, uh, it actually it did happen in a couple of central bank cases we know about. Now, these are, well, these are really interesting cases. And, and does it matter? Does it matter if you're a central bank and you have losses? Does it matter if you're a central bank and you're technically insolvent? Well, the Fed says this mandate is neither to make profits nor avoid losses. Uh, but, the, but that's not quite true because the Fed is clearly structured to make profits through seniorage by being the monopoly issuer of currency. And it's certainly not intended by the Federal Reserve Act that the Federal Reserve Banks would make large losses. That, that isn't in the, in the, in the scheme. And now now the, uh, uh, the Swiss Central Bank says, quote, a healthy balance sheet is a key prerequisite for the Swiss National Bank having room to maneuver over the long run to devote full attention to its mandate, and our legislation pays, places substantial weight on the, S on the Swiss National Bank maintaining an appropriate level of equity, whereas the Federal Reserve basically is telling us, pay no attention to that uh, balance sheet of ours and that, uh, that negative net worth behind the curtain. Well, which one is right? Um, I don't know. I'm thinking about that. Uh, the third portion of the bad year for the Fed is, as Paul has detailed, and also Jerry, a push from the administration 
and the Democratic majority in the House to take on a politicized agenda. It first of all can't do well and secondly shouldn't do at all. Uh, as the Wall Street Journal uh, has, has written, that to have the Fed practice racial favoritism is almost certainly violate, uh, almost certainly violates the Constitution. So potentially does the bill's requirement that public companies disclose to the Securities and Exchange Commission racial, racial gender identity and sexual orientation of its directors and executives, and the bill would politicize monetary policy and financial regulation, said the Wall Street Journal, and this seems accurate uh, to me. Um, so let's think about what are the mandates of the Fed. Paul has suggested the Fed already has more mandates it can accomplish, and its mandate should be reduced, not increased. Uh, and Jerry has agreed with that, and I agree with it too, that the mandate should be reduced, not increased. Um, we've already seen so vividly the Fed can't forecast accurately and therefore can't know the results of its own actions. It's failed, obviously, to provide its statutory mandate of stable prices. By the way, the statute does not say price stability, a vaguer, more ambiguous term. It says stable prices, a much clearer, less ambiguous uh, term. Uh, the Fed cannot manage the economy. It cannot ensure financial stability, but there are two things that it can do remarkably well. The first is financing the government. The real original re reason for all central banks is to finance the government of which they are a part. Uh, quoting again this uh, very interesting history of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, they write, uh, about the First World War. What really transformed the Atlanta Fed and its counterparts was the flood of government securities. During the war, the Fed was introduced, they write, to a role that would become familiar as the captive finance company of the U.S. Treasury. Uh, that's quite a good line. The captive finance company of the U.S. Treasury. Uh, in many situations and in many times, it's quite a quite an accurate line. The second thing that the Fed can do very well is financing a crisis. The original purpose, as contained in the preface to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, is to provide an elastic currency. Now, George would say that means a flexible currency. And indeed, an elastic currency or a flexible currency is very good to have when you're facing a crisis, including wars. They're especially good for financing wars uh, like we have now. We have a world economic war uh, with, with Russia. And the Fed did uh, step up to emergency financing a couple of times in recent decades, and most notably in 20, uh, 2020 and then in 2021, but the, you know, uh, when you step up to the crisis, when the crisis is over, you have to turn off the emergency uh, work. And uh, they're less good at stopping the emergency financing uh, than they are at doing the emergency financing. And a key and most egregious uh, point of this was their continuation of stoking the housing bubble in this country so that house prices were escalating at 15, 16, 18 percent a year, and all the time the Fed was still buying uh, mortgages. That, in my opinion, and, and many others, was an egregious mistake, which we are now paying for, and that, that house price inflation is now working its way through CPI inflation in the form of sh the cost of shelter, which have to be paid by all households, and so... We're paying for that as well as, uh, as in the mark-to-market -market losses of the Fed's own balance sheet. Now, um, another way of thinking about the huge mortgage portfolio, as I think Jerry mentioned, was its credit allocation. It was using the central bank to allocate credit to a particular sector 
namely housing. This was something that William McChesney Martin, the longest serving Fed chairman, warned us against. He said doing that will violate a fundamental principle of sound monetary policy to subsidize special sectors. Subsidizing special sectors, as we're now seeing with the legislation we have been discussing, is a permanent temptation of politicians to use the central bank and its money printing uh, monopoly to subsidize favored constituencies. Um, that's a temptation which should be guarded against, and it leads in the radical, I'm sorry, Paul, I'm a couple minutes over, over but I am getting to the end. Uh, uh, it leads in the worst case to the central bank digital currency in its bad form where the digital currency pays interest and becomes a dominant state bank instead of a central bank managing the, the money supply and trying to create a sound currency. It becomes a credit allocating state bank operating on a political basis. The uniform experience of the world is that these things always end badly, and it would here too if we let it continue. Now, all of this demonstrates Scholl's paradox. Scholl's paradox is this, and this is named after Bernie Scholl, who is a great uh, scholar of the history of the Fed. Scholl's paradox is the more the Federal Reserve blunders, the more power and prestige it gets uh, over history. This is very true, actually. The more inflationary and deflationary blunders it has made, the more powerful it has become. It's about to happen again. We have another inflationary blunder and another attempt to move major additional powers to the Federal Reserve. So, as others have said, I think we ought to do the opposite of Scholl's paradox. Having had more blunders, we ought to reduce the number of mandates, not increase uh, the number of mandates. And uh, let me just quickly list a few things that we ought to have. The Fed should own no mortgages. It owned no mortgages for almost its whole history. It should go back. Their target shouldn't be reducing the mortgages. It should be having zero mortgages uh, as before. It should do no social engineering. Uh, it should give up the idea that it should promote perpetual inflation uh, at any rate and instead pursue, as, uh, as Fed hero Paul Volcker proposed in his autobiography before he died, sound money. The Fed should have sound accounting for its own operations and we should take away its ability to set its own accounting rules. They have to, should have to keep their books like everybody else in a, uh, in a transparent uh, way. Um, we should prohibit the Fed from buying inflation-protected securities because if they can buy inflation-protected securities, they can manipulate the market uh, inflation premium. And we, everybody tries to use the comparison between tips and nominal treasuries to estimate inflation expectations. Well, if you want to get an estimate, you can't let the Fed manipulate the tips rate. Uh, we should take away the Fed's paying the expenses of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's another subsidy from the Fed to a particular constituency. And we ought to go back to uh, William McChesney Martin's bills only doctrine for the amount of assets which match interest bearing variable rate liabilities. In other words, you shouldn't let the Fed make itself into the equivalent of a large, large S. Now, well, there are a few things we could, we could argue about all of these, but these would, these would reverse Scholl's paradox. And in all of this, it is to revise our understanding of the Fed. There is no mystique. There is no special understanding. It, and uh, we need to understand that and therefore expect mistakes. And it's not a disaster. They have mistakes. They have mistakes like uh, everybody else. Uh, and they will have bad years like everybody else does and like they're having this year. Thank you, officer.
I want to summarize a few things that I think I heard here and, and get some questions around them. So first I'll come back to this point of both, I think, Jerry and um, George made that the Fed has it exactly wrong. They have an ambiguous target and they gave very specific forward guidance and what we really need is a very specific target, um, be it an inflation target or a nominal GDP target, and we need to have guidance that's far more ambiguous than what they've been offering. And I think Alex here points out their ability to forecast even short, short term ahead has really been bad. I mean, they, they put out their forecast. How can you have any forward guidance if they don't have any ability to forecast? Why should we listen to any of that is one question. And when you go, if you're going to do a fl an inflation target, you know, somebody's got to set the target. Jerry, Jerry says, okay, or uh, Congress should set the target. Should it set it forever or maybe it can vary over time? But what happens if the Fed can't meet its target? What do we, what do, we do to it? Do we, do we sack, do we change the law so we can sack governors and chairmen and Fed officials? How much can they miss it by before they lose their job? I mean, if they just have a target, but nothing <laughs> happens to them, like is now, so they get called up and, and people yell at them in grandstand, but they do that at every congressional hearing I've ever been at uh, and testified at. So I mean, what's, what's new? I mean, they have, to, they have to have some skin in the game to meet the target. And then we come to the legal, the legal side of the Federal Reserve. These seems to be the most uh, incredible legal, legal eagles in the whole entire world. They interpret all kinds of things in their favor, and nobody seems to have any way to say, hey, wait a minute, that's not what the law says. The law doesn't say you can pay, you shouldn't, the law doesn't really say you can pay banks' reserves way higher than the Treasury bill rate. Who, who says that's okay? How can you in, interpret uh, inflation to, be, you know, stable prices to be a constant 2% inflation? And then they were debating 3% inflation and maybe 4% inflation. So how, how, do we, how do we rein that in? That seems like a, a bit of a problem. Then what about the issue of QE? In my view, QE actually fueled the legislation now for equity and equity in, in the markets because QE inflated all kinds of asset prices that you know certain racial and ethnic groups tend to own more of and inflated, inflated housing prices and it tend to disadvantage other folks who didn't have financial assets, risky financial assets or housing. And so the QE operations were, it, it really did impact financial asset prices, housing market prices, I think it. I think it fueled this this demand for this uh, these equity agenda mandates. So I, I wonder if there's not some sort of circle there, some sort of circularity that maybe you know Q, kill QE and and maybe we don't we don't need the other. Or I'll, I'll stop there. I want to come back to nominal GDP targeting and in in after we. But I want to throw those out for you guys to start with. So uh, take it away. <clears throat> okay. Um, the Fed can interpret the law on excess reserves, the interest on reserves, the way it wants, because nobody can, it's not obvious who would sue them and say they were damaged. That is, is that, that is, the Fed interprets the law one way. And then the question is, is if you're going to try to enforce it to make them do something else, somebody has to have standing to sue them. Yeah. And to have standing to sue them, you have to have been harmed. And so it's not obvious that there's anybody who could sue them or would have an incentive to sue them, to force them to do the opposite. Somebody <clears throat> must have been a harm. Somebody must be harmed by this. <clears throat> if it's not yeah, but they'd have to be worse off as defined by courts. And that gets isn't that something we need to fix? <laughs> or, or is the Fed ever accountable if nobody can... <laughs> If nobody can hold them accountable. Congress, obviously, is not very good at it. Well, I think it's re the reason I started with that question is because it's kind of related to the next question you asked, which is, okay, suppose we have an inflation target. Suppose we say the inflation target's 2%. Suppose that the Fed generates an inflation of 10%. What do we do? Yeah, it seems like the obvious solution you know, fire somebody. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> replace the, the, board. the governor, the central bank is out of there. That is that they're they don't have four years, no matter what they do, 
which is what they have now, and it's performance contingent. That would be a big improvement. That would, would be a big improvement. As far as I, mean, I know... No offense to Powell, but he wouldn't be there. As far as I know, there's only been one Fed chairman actually, in effect, fired by the president, uh, which was in 1951 was, by oh, yeah. President Truman. He didn't act, fire him, but he yeah. effectively fired him but by G, making it clear he was dissatisfied. G, and he quit. G, yeah, and G. William Miller, Miller was promoted out of that well, job. He was into, promoted into out. Secretary he was effectively Treasury fired. He was but <laughs> Truman effectively fired the, in order to make way for William yeah. McChesney Martin, who he thought was his man, and it wasn't. Yeah, that's true. I, actually, it's not true. What's well, not true? Uh, that, that story oh, about... Oh, no! I hate it. It should be true. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you look into the correspondence, actually, uh, the, the fellow, I can't remember his name, he's, he's the one who, uh, uh, who negotiated this famous Treasury Accord where they got away with, with not fixing, they were not, did not go along with the fixing of interest rates. And I can't remember his name. But it turns out he was, he was planning, wanting to resign. He wanted right? to I thought I read that story in one of your books, George. You could well have, but I just do that sort of thing to fool people. No, I, I don't, I, I think that, uh, well, that, I take that it back. I, I, I've seen the, the correspondence yeah. between them, and they were actually on very good terms. I thought uh, that's what uh, Truman, Truman wrote. But that, anyway, then uh, it's the case is even stronger if no one has ever been fired. Yeah. Um, one thing on the uh, legal uh, question of uh, interest on reserves is that even if someone had standing to sue, the doctrine of the Chevron deference would would, uh, would uh, pretty much guarantee uh, a verdict in the Fed's favor, uh, unless this general principle of deferring to the regulatory authorities were itself changed. Uh, I think that uh, the odds are that you could not expect uh, the suit to mm. result in a, a verdict in the, the complainant's uh, favor. So we're stuck either way. We ought to look. The 2% the inflation target was invented by New Zealand, and it was a deal between the government, which is, of course, a parliamentary system. So you have the, the government, which is part of the parliament, and the central bank. The uh, original target was, everybody says two, it was really zero to two, zero to two percent. Uh, and I, I can't remember whether there was a punishment. I think there was, maybe, if the governor, do you know, George? Yes. There, the, the, the contract uh, did say that certain sanctions uh, could kick in. But there were so many clauses, ifs, ends, buts, and maybes, <laughs> that if you really took a good look at the thing, uh, uh, you, you could see that the odds that any actual sanction would be applied uh, were practically uh, zero. Uh, so although the story is often told that uh, the uh, governor of the bank in New Zealand would lose his job if the inflation rate went over 2% for any considerable period, there was practically no, no, no truth to it because the, the law had uh, no teeth. Uh, it just was coulda, shoulda, woulda, maybe done something. <laughs> so nothing So the on. same problem. Paul. Same problem, yeah. Well, and you have a different problem too, which is you can always say, well, it's s supply constraints. It wasn't my fault. Yeah. But, you know, and so... Fed, so Central banks are really good at saying it's other people's faults. They are. You're well, very gets, bad at saying it's our fault. That gets you back to the whole NGDP <laughs> thing. And the reason I like it, NGDP rule, the main reason is that uh, it's a rule where, yes, it allows you to see through supply shocks, but that's all. That's all. You can't right. say... If the NGDP growth rate goes above 5% persistently, you can't say supply shocks because... That, that, that means the price level would go above, but doesn't give you an excuse to, to let the actual level of spending itself rise uh, above target. Uh, so, uh, and that's, that's why I think there's a real substantive difference between that and inflation target, precisely because you really wouldn't want to have a central banker stick to a hard and fast inflation target 
uh, to keep his job or for any other reason, uh, if truly the supply side of things right. is going out of uh, 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 going out of whack, because it but, really is but painful the, but, for people. But that was kind of the Fed's story last fall, right? So every, we shut down everything from COVID. There's supply chain problems. It's really a supply shock. It's going to be transitory. But the problem with these transitory price shocks, even I think under GDP, nominal GDP targeting, is once the price level goes up, if people don't get raises, they're poor. So they're going to want raises to catch up with the price level. I mean, it doesn't, well, it doesn't, everybody just doesn't say, well, the price level went up by 10%. I'm 10% poor. I am trust the Fed's going to keep, keep me 10% poor forever, so I'm okay with that. They really, they really don't. So if, 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 the infl- if the labor markets are tight, they're going to, they're going to argue for, to get that 10% back. All right, but if you tighten uh, money to prevent prices from going up, they're well, then, actually then you not cause a recession up. or something. Their so, income so you're down. Just, aren't, <laughs> aren't you just pushing with inflation targeting the, the problems into the future? No, I mean, does it, it really fix anything? Paul, if you reduce nominal spending, which is what yeah. you have to do to keep the output prices from rising, nominal wages and in earnings have to go down. So those people are going to suffer e- even more. And if they have any fixed income obligations, that's going to mean the, the pain is, is even worse. And companies, companies have historic earnings, right? Your average firm needs to make back what it spent. That's all. It would be nice if it made more, right? So let's allow for a normal profit. When you tighten money to keep prices from rising because of, uh, of adverse supply shocks, nominal earnings go down all around. I mean, they do, you should say the, I should say the rate of growth of nominal earnings is going to be slower than usual because there's usually an upward trend these days. And, and that means that recovery of costs for the average firms becomes impossible. Debts, outstanding debts, you have less er- income. If you have an outstanding debt and mortgage or fixed debt of any kind and the price level goes up, but your income stays the same, nominal income, your ability to pay your debt is still what it was. But if the price level doesn't go up, but your earnings come down, you're in trouble. So all things considered, it's true, people will suffer one way or the other when adverse supply shocks occur, because the reality is worse. But okay, let, you, okay. they suffer more We're if incomes... Got to get to the shrink. audience in a second. Yeah. But yeah. One, one question with the, the flexible inflation targeting. Why was it such a problem uh, if inflation's running at 1.5%? What's the problem there? I mean, why did we have to get it above 2% for a while so we average 2%? What was the problem when inflation basically stable running... One, one and a half, one and three quarters. Is it just the zero lower bound zero, problem? N- which no is, problem, which, I would say. Yeah, which is that really a problem? Is that really the problem it was made out? Is it better now that we have 10% inflation? So we're a lot farther away from the zero lower bound. I didn't think it was a problem. Yeah, I mean, neither. I mean, it was a little bit of a problem in the sense, oh, we're targeting 2%. We're always hitting one and three quarters. You know, and so it is kind of related to the question of what would, what would a target mean? is the central bank would rather be on the money, or at least be on the money sometimes, not never. Um, and so I suppose that was part of it. Um, I, think, I think there was, you have to remember the economic theory that the board is using. I mean, the economic theory that the board uses is basically that, how do you get inflation? Oh, economic activity increases. And so the inflation rate rises. And so if you want economic activity increase, then you tolerate a little bit more inflation and you get more economic activity. And isn't that nice? Yeah. And so I think that's part of it, frankly. But, but they didn't but they didn't get lower. <laughs> they, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. We let's go to the audience here. So we'll take over there first and then own a second. Oh I'm Carl Carl Polzer. Um, really good discussion. Thank you so much. I started a project six years ago to prom- uh, look at the inclusion of low-income people in, in capitalism, um, and I advocate for the bottom half, which is a fool's errand, but I like doing that. And I was com- going to come here with a question about the helicopter money, and I'm really glad you brought it up, um, Mr. Dwyer. Um, I think there, what I'm going to propose is we need to look more carefully at the distributional of causes and effects of stimulus and bailouts. Like, 
in, in the context, what I worry about from my perspective, the poor people in this country are going to get, are, the conservatives are going to start blaming them for inflation. So the, the, the one in $2,000 checks that were sent out that the Fed helped to finance, you know, the sort of com combined fiscal monetary policy, helicopter money, if you, you, you would, or half a helicopter. That, but how much, I, I think what we need to think about though is what if, what if the money was more progressively tar targeted? If it hadn't been given to people in the middle of the top so much, what if it was, there wasn't all this other money sloshing around from the housing, from the, you know, bailing out the corporations? Um, that money, I think the giving the wealthy people more money with cap capital to bid up prices is going to cause a lot more inflation than giving people at the bottom a little bit of money just to pay their bills. They don't have much leverage to drive up prices. And where I get my theory from is Richard Cantillon. But the, the stimulus checks were, Which, were, that, were directed by Congress. Where you, the, where you put the money in, like where the money's injected yeah. into the system stimulates a lot more in first instance. Yeah, the, the, Q, the, QE, yeah. the QE the Fed was in charge of. The stimulus payments, Congress decided. The Fed funded them. But there were a lot of other programs that, that were targeted at poor people like mortgage uh, forbearance, rent forbearance, uh, student loan forbearance, and some of that went to rich people too. There were rich people, I'm sure, that didn't pay their mortgage or their student loans. Um, I, I know I didn't get any stimulus checks, uh, and I doubt anybody here did. They, it, it wasn't that... that my well, wife. I didn't have a PPP. My one. wife got one, she got a and she sent it back, and oh. they didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They were most wow. they yeah. were most puzzled by her well, response. Yeah. What are you sending that this to me back. for? Right, I'm sure. But, so, I, but that was a highly ethical response. I mean, so the Fed wife. wasn't responsible for who got <laughs> who's who got the checks. They did fund the government, you know, government program by buying bonds and things. But I mean, I don't I don't think that was the the Fed may get blamed for it in the end somehow. But I don't think. I don't think the thing you're pointing at was, a, was the Fed's choice. And they um, did extend, as I said in my remarks, the bond buying and the mortgage buying far past the point when the crisis was over. The boom was already on. Yeah. Oh, no, can we go to you next? Yes, I've got a couple of things to say. Una MacDonald. Thank you. Uh, they really directed at George. I had one for you, Gerald. Dyer, but I think it's all going to take too long, so I won't okay. get into that. I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Um, when Mark Carney introduced forward guidance the Bank of England, my immediate response was, uh, well, I hope he's got a well-polished crystal ball, which is plain he didn't have. <laughs> but no matter how vague you make the so-called forward guidance, every single word is going to be scrutinized, and people will draw their own conclusions from it. So... Just vagueness, I think, is not going to get a central bank out of the problem. I'd say just don't issue it. Give your analysis of the current economic state of affairs and let people draw their own conclusions from that. Um, secondly, the supply shock. I think that this is much more important than you seem to recognize and involves a conflict in the objectives for the Federal Reserve, i.e. climate change, because what this has led to in deliberate government policy, as we know, is to restrict the availability of fossil fuels, and particularly oil, as much as possible, thereby contributing to sending the price up. And the trouble with the costs of energy is that they affect the price of everything else all goods and services, if I, especially if I include fertilizer in that, they will have their effects throughout the whole of the economy. So it is not simply a supply chain that it's getting more difficult to get X, Y, or Z. It is a fundamental cost, and that is an extremely important contributory cause to driving prices up here, and it's one which the Fed has to follow contradictory policies, or it should not have the policy of climate change at all as part of its remit, and that should be left to the administration, and we can be as critical of the administration's policies as we like. So supply chain, if it's 
energy prices, and if it's mm -hmm. deliberate policy, it affects the price of everything. And forward guidance, forget it. Yes. Well, I, I think I've been somewhat misinterpreted as saying I, I want forward guidance to be ambiguous or anything. What I said is <laughs> it's forward guidance should not be such as locks the Fed into any policy that it might later wish to renege on. Now, there are forms of, foreign, for, of forward guidance that don't do that. They're not ambiguous, saying we're going to keep interest rates down uh, at zero as long as we feel it's necessary to get out of this crisis. It's not that's, not a, that's not an informative forward guide. Well, that's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true because it... it Actually, uh, it could be over-informative yeah, because it could well, easily they're, they're lead not, to believe they're, they're that they're raise, not going to do anything forever. No, but they're not going to say, we're going to raise rates before we need to. <laughs> well, <laughs> the point is, that. <laughs> it is not going to put them in a trap where they've committed to something they can have made a commitment that they can't keep. That's all. Sounds like, George, you're... Uh, repeating the old forecaster's advice, never to name an amount in a it's day. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's all. My advice is about certain kinds of guidance they should not supply. That's all. So now, what, do you, what do you think about in the, in, the, in the current setup, there's forecasts or projections is what the they're dot, called. Dot plots. Huh? Dot yeah. plots. Yeah. The dot plots. And the, well, you I, think they should eliminate I, those? Yes. I, mean, yes. I think they're a big pain in the behind because they're interpreted as, as, they're not interpreted as just opinions about what it rates are likely to do. They're interpreted as, as uh, statements about preferred uh, a policy path. Sure. And that, that well, that's is the question they're bad, supposed to be answering. Well, that's a, but it is, it is, <laughs> it is a bad kind of forward guide. I, I think it's a bad kind of forward guide. I agree, too, and also because the median becomes overemphasized. Sure, sure. sure. But I want to address uh, Una's other point, because uh, I think, Una, you're conflating a bunch of different things. It's one thing to say the Fed should have a climate change agenda. I've never said anything like that. What I said is they should allow the price level to rise if there are adverse supply shocks that have nothing to do with Fed policy. That's all I'm saying. And, if, and you might say, oh, well, when the price of oil goes up because of these shocks, it means all kinds of other prices are going to rise. That's true, but the Fed cannot make that not happen. The Fed cannot make the cost of things not go up when oil becomes a scarcer resource. But I did say that it, the climate change agenda is, is, is uh, yeah. at odds with price stability. I, I did yeah, say that's that. Yeah, that's a different point. But, but, it's yeah. a policy, not a shock. What? It's a policy, not a shock. What's a policy? It's a policy. Not a shock. What's a policy? Climate change. Agenda. Climate change. Yes, but why are you pointing at me? I didn't even use the words climate change, for goodness George, sake. George, it's your deep, soothing George, voice. It's just because you're so interesting, George. I'm talking about the kind of thing got, that happened in Russia. We've got time for Let's take another question okay, or two. Well, Back I want here. to get off the hook of uh, put on Any, it. <laughs> Back here. Um. The way that the way that this conversation has been framed uh, is kind of a, a critique of the Fed. You've used words like fail and can't and so on and so forth. And I wonder if rather than looking at the Fed as an omniscient, on, omnipotent uh, kind of wizard behind the curtain, if it's more appropriate to actually look at it as the heel character uh, in wrestling, where they are not the celebrity, they're the person that is there, uh, but who effectively at the end of the day, you know they are going to lose. Um. <laughs> we should certainly be realistic about it. No, I, I agree I, with that. You do? <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know about I the think, wrestling analogy. I think, I think people at the Federal the FOMC Federal Reserve Board, they're, they're trying to do what they think is the right thing. I, I, do, I do not think they're human, they make mistakes. I think part of it is the economics isn't well enough developed to know how to, to do any of this to have price stability and full employment and all the other things they, I mean, if you, and I know George has done it and others too, but if you go back and you read the transcripts, 
as you go through time with the FOMC debates, they're always making it up as they go and telling stories afterwards why it worked or didn't work. It's not like they have some grand theory. and set the, the, it, They go from meeting to meeting to meeting and discuss, hey, what we said last time didn't work. Why did we blow it? Oh, well, the, ne- the Nehru or the Nairu, uh, we think it may have fallen. Well, it, it's, they're all totalitarian total, 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 total kind of ex- explanations for what's going on. They don't really know what's going on. They kind of have a feeling it's not their fault. Economists don't really know what's going on, in my opinion. And, and, and I am an economist, uh, uh, and I've been there and, and seen this. You know, in, crisis, in normal times, when things are going okay, you kind of keep doing what you're doing, and it works okay. But when, when things change a lot, you, it takes a while to catch on. That's why they're always backward looking. Well, we, don't, we won't know if there's a recession for another two or three years <laughs> when the data come in. They, but they're, do, they're doing the best they can. But it, you might, you know, some boards and some chairs might do a little better because they have a little better intuition or whatever. It's not, they're human, they're human. And this, the state of economics is, isn't that good. That, that's my opinion. You guys go tell me I'm wrong. It's just that I'm a bad economist. But well, I think all the economists are, you're right about most of them, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I'll just say I'll, I'll keep I, will, I will say I don't think I never knew anybody who went to work for the Federal Reserve because they wanted to make most people in the U.S. worse off. Yeah, that was not what they were trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Although no, they may that have doesn't done mean it. they didn't do it sometimes. And they weren't yeah. trying they to lose either. They were trying to get it right. But yeah, Paul, I would say in my opinion, everything you said is absolutely correct. You don't have to be nice to me, Alex. You can disagree. <laughs> I, I, that is my but, sincere um, opinion. All right, we got like two minutes left. Uh, right here, please. Uh, Jim Grant wrote that Fed is both arsonists and yeah, firehouse. Fire. You got that from me, by the way. <laughs> you got that from me. Just saying. It's a, it's a good line. It's a good line. Do you agree with that? <laughs> he probably does. It's his phrase. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's in, I don't think it's intentional though. But yes, they they can start fires. They then have to put out. I oh, think for sure. Uh, J- James Grant, who has James Grant Interest Rate Monitor, a very famous market watcher, says the Fed calls it the Fed both the arsonist and the and the fire chief or the firehouse, and they do create. Yes, at times they create problems. They have to come back and fix. They seem to do it periodically, <laughs> regularly. <laughs> Well, and it, I think the purpose of a discussion right. like this one is to try to make that periodic less often. Less periodic, yeah. You know, longer, longer, I mean, longer periods. I mean, George has a paper where he basically wrote, "If you knew in 1913 what the Fed's record would be for the next hundred years, <laughs> you, you, would <laughs> you wouldn't pass. You wouldn't pass. You would You say no, <laughs> no, please. Well, the depression, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all by itself. Yeah, yeah." Um, <laughs> And so, and so the idea is is to try to change the you know try to change the institutions so that they they work better for in, in accomplishing what we're trying. Yeah. I mean, and there are there are problems, sort of like you know, Paul was saying, okay, so you don't hit the inflation target. What are you going to do to me? Apparently, reappoint me. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that that's punishment enough then. <laughs> 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 I think we've got maybe one more minute, one more maybe half a minute. So. Um, I do have a question from the outside here. Um, <laughs> over time, does the collective wisdom of the FOMC produce better, less inflationary economic outcomes over time than the financial markets would produce in a world in which there were no Fed interest rate manipulations? So if the Fed didn't try to manipulate the... In- I don't know, then what would the central bank do? There's no... There's no such thing as no Fed interest rate manipulation, first of all. It's just a, there's this idea that the Fed can do nothing. And I've written about this, and it, it can't. It can't do nothing. If it doesn't purchase bonds, if it leaves the interest rate on reserves alone, it's still doing something, and it could still be doing something wrong. So I don't know what people mean when they said the Fed shouldn't manipulate interest rate. I, I, I literally don't think you can attach any serious meaning to that concept. You could talk about an alternative world where there's a gold standard or, you know, and you have to spell out the whole thing. And then you could try to ask what interest rates would be like then and how they'd compare. But you otherwise, know, it's I, hard I can to give answer. you a hypothetical world in which the Fed doesn't do anything to interest rates. 
And that world is such that the Fed says, well, we're going to keep the interest rate at 4%, and we're going to keep it at that forever, and we're not going to change it. And we think that'll produce most of the time 2% inflation, but maybe sometimes 3 maybe sometimes 4 maybe sometimes 1%. And we're not going to do anything. Not changing interest rates. And people actually rates. believe them. Not changing It's interest important rates. that they be credible. Yeah. yeah, but not changing interest rate policy isn't the same as not having an interest rate policy that's influential. Those are very different things. I guess we could say you could imagine a world where there is no central bank, that's which right. was the world of the United States uh, yeah. before 1913, but yeah. there were still the functions were performed by the U.S. Treasury instead of the central bank, or at least many of the yeah. functions. Were or clearing houses well, or things or like that. Or could be performed. If you're going to have a fiat money system, something has to determine the quantity of fiat money or That's right. it blows up. That's exactly my point, is that if that is a fiat money system, somebody is in there having some bearing on We can speak about However the However it is they're doing it, even if they yeah. just keep it constant forever. That's right. The constant interest rate isn't to do nothing. No, I mean it. constant fiat money, too. That's the same thing. To. Gentlemen? Yeah. But as always, the counterfactual is difficult to answer with, with any degree of confidence. And, and we're going to have to wait till next time we meet to answer it, because unfortunately, <laughs> we're out of time. So um, please thank my panelists for a very interesting conversation. And thank you, the audience. And thanks mm -hmm. for watching. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.